turning out of Wall Street, stocks rallied on word of a deal in Congress that would avoid a devastating U.S. default. Relieved investors bought up stocks, sending all the major indexes soaring, each rising more than 1 percent. The Dow surged 205 points. The Nasdaq jumped 45, closing at its highest level since the year 2000. And the S&P added 23 points. It's just a few points away from a new record high. So with a budget deal looking like it'll pass tonight and hundreds of thousands of furloughed federal workers preparing to go back to work, just how much has the 16-day partial government shutdown cost the economy? A lot. The ratings agency Standard & Poor's now says the 16-day shutdown has shaved at least six-tenths of one percent off the nation's GDP, which adds up to a staggering loss of $24 billion ripped right out of the economy. And if that Senate bill doesn't become law tonight and the country defaults on its debt, S&P says the economy would take an almost immediate 4 percent hit, sending the U.S. into another recession. Here's another negative from the shutdown and debt ceiling crisis. The money taken out of long-term stock and bond mutual funds. According to the Investment Company Institute, outflows from U.S. stock and bond mutual funds added up to around $5.5 billion just last week. For the week ending October 9th, domestic equity funds had outflows of more than $5 billion, while foreign equity funds added $2 billion. And municipal bond funds saw $1 billion move out. So, a climactic day in Washington and for Wall Street. The question now, what's next for the markets, the economy, and your money? Here with answers, Mohamed El Arian, CEO and co-chief investment officer of PIMCO, the world's largest bond fund manager, and Richard Madigan, chief investment officer with J.P. Morgan Private Bank, two of my favorite folks on Wall Street. Welcome to you both. Uh, right. Mohamed, let me begin with you, but I want to start uh, by running a little soundbite from earlier today from your friend and rival, uh, Larry Fink of BlackRock, where he expresses his sadness over what he saw this country just go through. I would say there, there's a profound sadness. They looked at the United States as a beacon of hope. They looked at the United States as a great place to have a secured an investment. And now they're raising questions is that, are those foundational principles correct going forward? And that's what I'm frightened of. The answer is I, I don't see any overt change in behavior yet, but I'm being asked questions related to this, and it may lead to changes in behavior. Mohammed, what do you think there? He's referring to our standing in the world as a safe investment haven, our Treasury securities most especially. How do you react to what you just heard? So we're all being asked these questions. The rest of the world is looking at us, Thailand, saying, what are you up to? How can you be so irresponsible if you are the issuer of the reserve currency and if we, if we have delegated to you our financial intermediation? After all, we save by holding your bonds. So the rest of the world is confused, is taken aback. Now, you cannot replace something with nothing. So it's not as if they can go elsewhere in the short run. But it's not a good idea to do this, because at some point, they're going to build pipes around the U.S., and that would harm our economic interests and our national security. Uh, Richard, let me, and, and Mahama too, let me uh, bring up some comments that came from the National Retail Federation today, and this is a quote, uh, saying, our economic recovery is retail-led and consumer-driven, and political leaders on both ends of Pennsylvania Avenue need to stop undermining consumer confidence with partisan posturing. When consumers cut back their spending, it threatens jobs in every industry. So let me ask you, Richard, and, and Mohammed, feel free to jump in on this, is that to what extent has this episode, what has it done to consumer confidence, and what is it going to take, how long is it going to take for American businesses and the economy to bounce back from all of this? Susie, from my perspective, I think the critical issue to this was what Washington accomplished was diminishing politics out and fundamentals back in. So if this goes on longer, I think it becomes something of real meaningful consequence. Beige Book today, and that was data through October 7th, continues to show uh, resilient consumption, retail still in place, and growth. And S&P's numbers that Tyler talked about in terms of cutting back growth by 60 basis points, I would have probably argue they were over 
overing, overreaching a little bit in their expectations, we still have a view that we'll see 2% growth this year. So confidence matters, but I think what the government accomplishes is getting people back to the fundamentals. And from where we are in markets right now, you'll recognize we've literally reset to where we were September 18th, right after the FOMC meeting. That's good news. Mohammed, markets, uh, broadly speaking, bond markets and the stock market, maybe more especially, didn't seem to freak out, didn't seem to overreact to what we've just gone through and, and hopefully what will come to a conclusion this evening. But how should I, as an individual uh, investor, position my money with the level of uncertainty that seems to be lingering <coughs> even tonight as we look ahead to uh, another set of deadlines two and three months down the road? How should I invest? So there were two assumptions that were key to the market feeling relatively calm about this. One is we would not default, and that was correct. The other one was this notion that you could look through the economic damage. Why? Because people who weren't being paid were going to be paid, so the damage would be temporary and reversible. This second assumption is more questionable today because what we got is not a resolution. You called it a truce. I would call it a ceasefire. We simply got a ceasefire for a few months. And if there's one thing you don't want to do is play Russian roulette with consumer confidence ahead of the holiday season. That's not a great time to do it. So our concern is that the bounce back will be less dynamic than it would have been otherwise because people know that there's a risk that we may go through all this again in January and February. Mohammed, the other thing that's up in the air is the U.S.'s credit rating. Uh, you know, does the U.S. deserve this sterling triple A rating given that we are going crisis to crisis? And if there is a downgrade, what, how is that going to impact investor confidence, not only here in the U.S., but around the world? So we deserve it in the sense that this is not an ability to pay, pay issue. We are so able to pay, Susie. This is a political willingness to pay issue. So if rationality prevails, which at the end of the day it will prevail because there's so much at risk, we are at AAA. Now, if we get downgraded, it is problematic. Okay? It is problematic because we are the AAA and a lot of people hold our instruments because we're the AAA. And also, treasuries are used as collateral. So it would mess up the plumbing of the system. So we, we need to avoid, not just for the good of the U.S., but for the good of the global system, we need to avoid more downgrades. Richard, you're, I know, a calm guy. You always make me feel a little more secure when I, when I listen to you. So, and I sense that you have not changed your portfolio standing very much through all of this, this high drama, this opera. What would you say for a typical investor would be a good asset allocation as we move into uh, the last quarter of this year and into 2014? I think separating views and vantage point from what is long-term money, Tyler, and what is short-term money. Long-term money we've stayed invested in, and the theme I keep hitting with the team is if we don't believe there's a fat left tail event that's coming, and we didn't around this, we put a, a low probability of an actual default around this, um, you stick the course. And to me, I think the most important for upside from here is recognizing how high we've risen. I mean, we have markets that are up 20%. It has been an outstanding year. Most investors feel really good about that. But I think what it does let people do is reset on the investment horizon. So short-term money can trade ranges, lots of volatility. Long-term money, stay the course, don't chase, and stay invested. All right, Richard Madigan, thank you very much. Pleasure. Appreciate your being with us. Mohammed El Arian, great as always to see you.